Acts chapter 11. We're grateful for the presence of everyone, and we do have a number of visitors today, and for this we are so grateful. We want you to know that you're our most honored and welcome guest, and we hope that you'll come back uh, by and visit with us anytime you have opportunity. We do want you to know that we're open to your questions and comments. If you see anything in these assemblies you don't understand, ask us about that. Don't leave with your questions unanswered. If you hear me say something in the pulpit that you don't understand, you can bring that to me. I'd be more than happy to discuss that with you or any other Bible subject. All we want to do is further the knowledge of God's Word, and to that end, we meet together on a regular basis. We open the Bible. This is our textbook right here. We open the Bible up. We try to learn what it says and put it into practice in our lives. I want to talk to you this morning about being just a Christian. In the text in Acts chapter 11, we have uh, the very first time the word Christian is used in the Bible. It says uh, and there was a new church that had been planted in Antioch, the city of Antioch, and verse 22 says, Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he had came and seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. That's the first time, as I said, the first time the word Christian is ever used in the Bible. And the word that's translated called in our Bible, the Greek word krimatizo, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, not a Greek scholar, so I may, may not pronounce it exactly right, but krimatizo uh, means a divine calling. The word is used nine times in the New Testament, and every time it is used, uh, it is a calling that was assigned by God or an oracle or a revelation from God. And so it is believed by myself and many others that this name, Christian, was divinely given. Uh, some scholars try to suggest that it was given by the enemies of Christianity. I don't believe that. I believe the text indicates that this was a divine name, a God-given name. And the word Christian simply means a follower of Christ. You know, I have always believed and I've always taught all my life that we should be just a Christian. Now, I say that in contrast to the religious world that we see today. We see the so-called Christian world where people wear different names. Uh, they wear names like Bath Baptist or Methodist or Lutheran or Catholic. And I'm not being, I'm not being derogatory. I, that's just a fact. I mean, we know that's true. There's no sense for us shying away from that. People wear these different names. And the very reason they wear those different names is because they are different. They believe different things, and they practice different things, and they honor different things, you see. That's the very reason that they do so, and it highlights a big problem in the Christian world, and that is division. Christians can't seem to get it together. People who claim to follow Christ can't seem to agree. And so I think one beginning place for us, if we all want to, want to really be united as the Lord wanted us to be, is to be just a Christian. We don't have to be some kind of Christian. We don't have to be a hyphenated Christian. You know, sometimes you hear people say, well, I'm a Baptist-Christian, or I'm a Methodist-Christian, and so you're a hyphenated Christian. You're some kind of Christian. And the truth of the matter is, you don't find that in the Bible. In the Bible, you were just Christians. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You won't find a passage where it says the disciples were called Baptists. You won't find a passage where it says the disciples were called Methodists. You won't find a passage where it says the disciples were called Catholic. Those things did not exist in the early church. That was under the guidance of the apostles of Christ. That was under the, the guidance of inspired men. And so what I want to do is just kind of use this as a starting place. Our plea here at Walton Chapel is for us to just be Christians. Can't we just do that? Can't we just call ourselves Christians? Can't, do we have to be some kind of a Christian? Do we have to differentiate ourselves from somebody else? Let's just be Christians. And so let's dig into that. Let's talk about that a little bit this morning. And I want to start off with an illustration. And I want you to think about the kinds of Jews there were in the first century. You see, this problem that we have today called denominationalism is not new. They had denominations among the Jews. Did you know that? That's a fact. They had denominational groups among the Jews. 
And so I've listed some of those up there. You could be a Pharisee, or you could be a Sadducee, or you could be a Herodian or an Essene. And so those were some of the Jewish sects, S-E-C-T-S, or denominations, that were in existence. Take your Bibles and turn uh, to the book of Acts chapter 23. And notice the Apostle Paul indicates that there were two sects. He actually got them to feuding with each other and got himself out of trouble. Paul uh, was making a defense of himself before the Sanhedrin council. In Acts chapter 23, Paul kind of looks around. He's in trouble for preaching Jesus, and so he looks around the council as he's making his defense, and he notices, you know, there's some Sadducees here and there's some Pharisees here, and if I can get them at odds with each other, that kind of get me out of trouble, it get me off the hook. And so in Acts 23, verse 6, it says, When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I'm being judged. Now, when you just read that, it seems like a pretty harmless statement, but he just lit a match. He, he just lit a match. And it says, verse 7, when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. He got them arguing with each other, you see. And why is that? Verse 8, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Now, we just learned something right there. In modern speak, the Sadducees were what we'd call liberals. They didn't take the Bible literally. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe that you had a spirit. They didn't believe in spirits. And because they didn't believe in spirits, they didn't believe in the resurrection, you see. And so they were, you might call them the liberals or even more so the modernists of our day. And so you had one denomination that was way out there on the left wing, so to speak, the liberals. They didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in spirits, and they didn't believe in the resurrection. But here come the Pharisees, they're the conservatives. They did. They did believe in angels. They did believe in spirits. They did believe in the resurrection. For what it's worth, I do too. And so did Paul. Paul believed in angels, and Paul believed in spirits, and Paul believed in the resurrection, and so do I, you see. And, and so they were the more conservative viewpoint. In fact, over in chapter 26, Acts 26, Paul says that the Pharisees were the strictest sect of the Jews. He's defending himself now before King Agrippa. And he says in verse 5, they knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So in Jesus' day, in Paul's day, you could be a conservative Pharisee, or you could be a liberal Sadducee, or you could be a Herodian. Take your Bibles just by way of reference and turn over to the Gospel of Mark chapter 3. And there are several references to the Herodians. I'll just make mention of this one. Mark chapter 3 and verse 6. And you indicate, as you know, these, they hated Jesus so much that these two Jewish sects got together to try and mess Jesus up. It says in Mark 3 and verse 6, The Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him, Jesus, how they might destroy him. They, they didn't believe anything alike. The Pharisees and the Herodians didn't believe much of anything alike. They were two separate sects, two separate religions, two separate denominations of the Jews. But they could join forces against Jesus. They hated Jesus that much, you see. But the Herodians, they were basically loyal to the Herod dynasty. And so that was, that was what distinguished them from the Pharisees and what distinguished them from the Sadducees. The Essenes are not mentioned in the Bible, but have you ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Way back in 1947, there was a little Bedouin shepherd boy wandering around the caves of the Dead Sea, and he picked up a rock, and he threw it into one of those caves, and he heard a clunk, and he sounded like something shattered and broke, and he went in there, and sure enough, there were some clay jars. And over the course of time, it was discovered those clay jars were filled with scriptures, and they had discovered what has come to be known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were writings of the Old Testament that dated, they were the oldest writings to be discovered to this day. They dated back, some of them, as far as 200 years before Christ, which indicates, by the way, because we actually have the manuscripts in our possession, that the Old Testament predates Jesus Christ, 
we have an Old Testament that for sure predates Jesus. But those were the Essenes. They were the ones who lived in those caves. They were, it was sort of like a monastery. Or a, a, like today we'd say a Catholic monk. They're kind of off by themselves, the Essenes. And they lived off by themselves in the caves. And it is believed by some scholars that John the Baptist was an Essene. I don't know if that's true or not. But we do know he lived out in the wilderness. We do know he, so he kind of matches, he kind of fits the profile. But you had that idea. So you could have been a, 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 of, of one of four denominations. A Pharisee, a Sadducee, a Herodian, or an Essene. Or you could be just an Israelite. I want you to think about that for a second. Turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John in chapter 1. I'm just trying to get across an idea here. The Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 43, we're going to read down to verse 47. This is when Jesus is kind of getting introduced to his disciples, or they're getting introduced to him, however you want to put that. In verse 43 it says, The following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and he said, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's a little skeptical. I never heard of anything like that. Philip said, well, come and see. Come check it out for yourself. By the way, I like that attitude. Don't just take somebody's word for it. Come and see. Come check it out. Investigate for yourselves. That's what we like you to do here. Investigate for yourselves and see if what we're telling you is the truth. So he says, come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him. Now watch this. He said, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. You see that word indeed? You know what that means? It means really or truly. A true Israelite. A real Israelite. A genuine Israelite. That's what that means. In other words, this guy is a real genuine Jew. He's not a Pharisee. He's not a Sadducee. He's not an Essene. He's, not a, he's just a Jew. And he, he got the praise from Jesus. By the way, Jesus didn't praise those other groups. He had some pretty bad things to say about the Pharisees. He had some bad things to say about the Sadducees. He had some bad things to say about the Herodians. But... Here was one he praised. Just an Israel. You're just an Israelite. There's no guile in you. There's no deceit in you. You're just plain and pure, just a Jew. Now I say all that just to illustrate a point. Let's fast forward now to our day. And let's look at the kinds of Christians today. And I just put some examples up here. We could, as we know, there are hundreds and hundreds of denominations. We could have a list a mile long. But I just put some examples up there. Uh, there are various kinds of Christians today. You know, today, you can choose to be a Catholic if you want to be. But to be a Catholic, you have to subscribe to the teachings of the Pope in Rome. You see, he's the head of that church, and he's regarded by them as infallible. When he speaks, ex cathedra, as they call it, from the chair, from the throne, he speaks infallible doctrine. In order to be a Catholic, you must accept the decrees of the Pope, even if they don't sound like this. What he says goes, you see. And so you could be that. You could be one of those and distinguish yourself from other believers. Or you could be a Methodist. The word Methodist uh, has to do with the way they conducted their religion. They had certain methods and patterns that they followed. And the Methodist group was started by John Wesley. And so, if you were going to be a Methodist, you would have to subscribe to the teachings of John Wesley. Now, the teachings of John Wesley are different than the teachings of the Pope. I guarantee you that. They do not teach the same thing. What the Pope says is one thing, and what John Wesley says is another thing. They do not teach the same things. They do not believe the same things. That's the very reason some are called Catholic and some are called Methodist, because they do not teach and believe and practice the same things. You could be... A Lutheran. A Lutheran is simply someone who follows the teaching of Martin Luther. One of the interesting ironies of history is that Martin Luther did not intend to start a group that followed him. You, there are quotes from Martin Luther. He said, listen, please, and just what I'm about to say right here, please just call yourselves Christians. Don't call yourself Lutherans. 
He, Martin Luther himself said that. Don't call yourself, just call yourself Christians, which is the very argument I'm making this morning. Just call yourself Christians. Don't try to be some kind of a Christian. Don't try to be some hyphenated Christian. Just be a Christian. Martin Luther tried to get his followers to see that, but they wouldn't see it. And they would subscribe to his teachings. But his teachings are different than John Wesley's. And John Wesley's teachings are different than the Pope's. And on and on and on we could go right down the line. And you could add one group after another. As I said, there's probably over 200, maybe even over 1,200, some estimates. There are different groups and, and different factions of those groups. Maybe as many as 1,200 different denominations out there. And so we could fill this board up with different groups. But I think you get the idea. But you know what? There's also something called a disciple indeed. Now remember the Israelite indeed? Remember him? Jesus said, of, he said, here is an Israelite indeed in whom is no God. Just a Jew, not a Pharisee, not a Sadducee, not an Essene, not a Herodian, just a plain old Jew. And he follows me and, and, and he listens to my word and he, and he obeys me and that's all that he is. That's all that he claims to be. He has no guile in him. Well, you know, that's also true of those who claim to follow Christ. Turn to John chapter 8. In John chapter 8. Jesus said in verses 31 and 32. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him. If you abide in my word. Stop right there. The word abide means to dwell in. To live in. To continue in. So Jesus has a word. It's my word. It's the word of Christ, you see. That's why we're called Christians. We follow Christ, you see. So if you abide in, dwell in, live in my word, you are my, there it is, disciples indeed. Did you see that? The word indeed, once again, means truly or really. As an illustration, think about the widow indeed. Hold your spot here just for a second. Turn over to 1 Timothy 5. Same, same phrase, same phrase. In 1 Timothy 5, and just one verse here, verse 5. He says, Now she who is a widow indeed, or my new King James says, really a widow. It means exactly the same thing. Really, truly a widow. And left alone, trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Why is she called really a widow or a widow indeed? Because her husband is dead and she's got no children. She's got no place else to go. She's got no one else to turn to. She's got no family. Her husband is gone. She has no children. she got no place. She's truly, really, genuinely a widow in every sense of the term. And the term is applied to the Israelite indeed in John chapter 1 and verse 47. And the term is applied to the disciple indeed in John 8 verse 32. Look at that. A disciple indeed. Indeed, not some kind of a disciple, not some hyphenated disciple, but a true, genuine, real disciple. You are my disciples indeed, and verse 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free from what? Well, I think in the context here, free from sin. But think about this, free from confusion, free from division, free from the confusion of all this mess. What kind of Christian are you? Are you a Baptist? Are you a Catholic? Are you a Methodist? Uh, what kind of Christian? And you can be free of all that. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You, can be free. you don't have to worry about what kind. Just be a Christian. Don't be anything else. Don't be any kind of Christian. Just be a disciple indeed. A true, real follower of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm appealing for this morning. That's what I'm asking you to be. I'm just, just asking you to be just a Christian and nothing else, you see. It's very simple. And, and so this is our plea. And as, that, that, as we introduce that thought, this raises some questions. There are some real problems with denominationalism. At the top of the list is just confusion. People look at the religious world, I'm confused. I don't know what to believe. I don't know whether I should believe in the Pope. I don't know whether I should believe in John Wesley. I don't know whether I should believe in Martin Luther. I don't know whether I should believe in John Smith. He founded the Baptist Church. I don't know what to believe. And so there's confusion out there. And people, they have no idea, where do I turn? What do I believe? What do I do? Where do I go? I want you to think about denominationalism with me for a moment. It's a problem. It's a problem. The word denominate, first of all. The word denominate, 
literally means to name. Now that's not inherently a bad thing. The name Christian is a name, isn't it? So it's not inherently bad to name something. But think about it in terms of the context in which we're using it here, denominationalism. I'm naming myself to distinguish myself from you. I'm a Catholic, therefore I'm not a Methodist, I'm not a Baptist, I'm not a Lutheran. You see, they're denominating themselves and distinguishing themselves. And this is glorifying their differences, isn't it? This, is, this glorifies their differences. I'm this and I'm not that, you see, is the idea. And so we name ourselves, we denominate ourselves. And the reason they're different is because, first of all, obviously they wear different names, but there's more to it than that. They believe different things. You know what a creed is? A creed, the word creed means I believe. A creed is a statement of beliefs. And these groups all believe different things. Catholics believe things different than Methodists do. And Methodists believe things different than Lutheran do. And so these names serve to accentuate those differences. We're not like you because we believe this. And the other group says, well, we're not like you because we believe that. And it's all serving to distinguish and to differentiate different beliefs and different practices. You go and you worship at one kind of church and you'll have one kind of a worship service. And you go and worship at another church and you'll have another completely different kind of worship service. So they, they wear different names and they believe different things and they practice different things. And those names are designed to accentuate that and glorify that. Listen to me very carefully right here. This is an important point. To glorify division among believers, so-called believers in Christ, is contrary to the Scriptures. The Scriptures condemn this. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to John chapter 17. John 17 is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. Notice how I phrased that. We know that there were times Jesus prayed all night long. But as far as the recorded prayers, John 17 is the longest recorded prayer that we have of Jesus. And in this prayer, he prays for himself, verses 1 through 5. He prays for his disciples, verses 6 through 19. And then he prays for us. You can see in verse, starting in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, these apostles of mine. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That encompasses even you and I today. Anyone who would believe in Jesus through the words of the apostles, you see. And so Jesus was praying for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. I pray for those who will believe in me through their word. What do you want, Jesus? What did he ask the Father? Look at this in verse 21. That they may be all divided up into different groups, believing different things and wearing different names. Is that what that says? And not what that says at all, is it? That they may all be one. Look at that. Is that what we see in the religious world today? We don't see oneness. We see division. We see the glorification of division. Because I'm this, which means I'm not that. And the other says I'm that, which means I'm not this. And we see division and the glorification of it. And that's contrary to his prayer. He said, I don't want that. That's not what I want. I want my disciples to be one. And, and, and to make it plainer, read on. As you, Father, are in me and I in you. Are there, you think there's any daylight between Jesus and his Father? There's no daylight between Jesus and his Father. And he says, I want my followers to be one just like that. I don't want there to be any differences. I don't want there to be any divisions. I don't want there to be any distinctions. I want them to be one. That they may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. See, this unity produces faith. People look at that and say, that's what I want to be. But when people look at the division, they don't know what they want to be. That's confusion. And there's a huge difference between the two. Between the confusion brought by the religious world of today and the glorification of division and the oneness prayed for by Jesus Christ. There's a huge difference between the two. Let's look at another passage here, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here was a, a single congregation that was divided up. And that's not good either. In 1 Corinthians 1, these people were divided over their favorite preacher. They had a case of preacheritis. And in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, Paul says, Now I plead with you. Let me just stop there. I'm pleading with you this morning. Just as Paul was pleading with the Corinthians, I'm pleading with you. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. 
Stop right there. How are we all going to speak the same thing? Can I suggest to you that if I speak what this says and you speak what this says, we're going to be speaking the same thing. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. If I speak what this says and you speak what this says, we're going to be speaking the same thing. And so I plead with you, I'm begging you that you speak the same thing and that there be, look at it now, no divisions among you. How simple can you make it? That's about as simple as you can make it. No divisions. That's not what we see. That's not what we see in the religious world today. But I want there to be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. What do you mean, Paul? Well, it's been declared to me, verse 11, concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Christ. Does that sound familiar? I'm a Catholic. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Lutheran. Well, I'm of Christ. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what he's talking about here. Division and, and, and naming and denominating and distinguishing themselves. There's no unity here. And Paul says that's a problem. Verse 13, is Christ divided? These are rhetorical questions. No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. So what are we doing? What are, what's going on in the religious world today? I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's wrong. Because that's not what the scriptures teach. And that's not what God wants. There's another, I want to throw in here, another definition of denominationalism, which I think helps us to understand some of the differences here. I put that last there, corruption of organization. If you look up in Webster's Dictionary, you look up the word denominationalism, or denomination, I should say. Look up the word denomination, and Webster says, listen carefully, an organized group of religious congregations. Now just stop and think about it. Sounds harmless, doesn't it? Sounds harmless. An organized group of religious congregations. Except for one thing. Do you know that there is no such animal in here? There is no such thing as an organized group of congregations in this book. Each congregation is independent and autonomous and stands on its own. Each congregation is an independent entity. And when you begin to link congregations together, and all these are the Baptist church, and all these are the Catholic church, and all you're, you're a denomination. By the way, some of my brethren do that too. They link congregations together. They call it a sponsoring church, but it's the same principle. An organized group of congregations is not to be found in the Bible because every church is organized alike. Acts 14 and verse 23, elders in every church. And those elders, they take care of that church alone. See, we've got two elders here. And they don't, they don't worry about telling some other church what to do. They're over this congregation. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2, tend the flock of God which is among you, you see. Well, when you start linking churches together, you're corrupting the organizational structure of the church. That, by definition, is a denomination. Some of my brethren need to wake up and see that, because by definition, that's a denomination. Well, let me bring this around here. How can we be just a Christian today? That's what I'm pleading for. How can we be just a Christian today? And can I just suggest to you, it's, the, the solution is very simple. Number one, give up all the human names. Stop calling yourselves Baptists, Catholics, Methodists. Stop. Stop. There is no such thing in the Bible. Those groups don't exist in the Bible. Those groups don't have any sanction in the Bible. Stop glorifying the names of men or the doctrines of men. Stop wearing the divisive names. If you want to be one as Jesus prayed, if you want to be one as Paul pled, then stop trying to distinguish yourself from others. Just be a Christian. Lay aside the names. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 1. We were looking at this earlier. You remember what he said? He said, I want you to be joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. If I can ever get my Bible, all my pages are wanting to stick together on me. 1 Corinthians 1, we saw it in verse 10. No divisions among you, perfectly joined together, in the same mind, the same judgment. Verse 13, we left off. Is Christ divided? Nope. Was Paul crucified for you? Nope. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Nope. 
Was the Pope crucified for you? Was he? Was John Wesley crucified for you? Was Martin Luther crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of the Pope? Were you baptized in the name of John Wesley? Were you baptized in the name of Martin Luther? Well, I sure hope not, because that ain't worth a dime. So he says, let's not be that way. In fact, he goes on from verse 13, verse 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized my own name. I don't want anybody calling themselves after Paul. I don't want anybody, to bring it up to our day, I don't want anybody calling themselves a Catholic or a Methodist or a Lutheran. More importantly, the Lord doesn't want it. Never mind what I want. The Lord doesn't want it. Just give up the human names. Number two, give up the human creeds. I wish I'd have brought them with me. I've got some books in my library just for informational purposes. But I've got a Methodist discipline. I've got a Baptist manual. I got a Roman Catholic catechism. Those are all books that are put out by those groups. You know why they have to have those books? Because you wouldn't know a thing about how to be a Catholic without a Catholic catechism. You won't learn that in here. <laughs> you won't learn how to be a Catholic in here. You won't learn how to be a Baptist in here. You won't learn how to be a Methodist in here. You won't learn. You won't, you've got to have those other books. And so I'm saying to you, lay them aside. Those are called creeds. Lay them aside. Throw them in the garbage. That's all they're worth. They're just garbage. They're not the Word of God. Throw them away. You want to be one? You want to just be a Christian? Throw those books away. Get rid of them. You don't need them. They don't have any information in there that will get you to heaven. Nothing there that you need. Just follow the Bible. Number three, give up humanly devised practices. These denominations have their own practices, their own traditions. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Jesus spoke about this, the danger of following human traditions. Matthew 15, verses 7, 8, and 9. Jesus said to the denominations of his day, You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! But their heart is far from me. How you know, Jesus? How you know their heart is far from you? He said, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Instead of teaching the scriptures, they're going to teach that Catholic catechism. Instead of teaching the scriptures, they're going to teach that Methodist discipline. Instead of teaching the scriptures, they're going to teach that Lutheran creed. And Jesus says, stop, stop. In vain do they worship me. In other words, that kind of worship is worthless. That's what vain means, worthless, pointless, going nowhere. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines and commandment of men. And then, the most amazing thing of all, you want to you want, you want be just a Christian? The answer is very simple. Just follow Jesus. That's so simple. Turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And Paul lays down a very important principle here. He says in verse 17, Whatever you do, now that's pretty broad, isn't it? Whatever you do in word, that's the things that you say and the things that you teach, or in deed, that's your actions, do all, how much? Some? No. Most? No. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know what the in the name of Jesus means? By his authority. Do what Jesus says. Forget about what the Pope says. Forget about what Martin Luther says. Forget about what John Wesley says. Just do what Jesus says. Where am I going to find that? Right here in this book. That's where you're going to find it. And that's how you're going to be just a Christian. The word Christian used three times in the Bible. The first place we looked at at the beginning, Acts 11, verse 26. The name Christian is God-given. That's the God-given name. He didn't give these other names. The name Christian is persuasive. You remember what Agrippa said to Paul in Acts 26 and verse 26, uh, 28? He said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. Notice that. He didn't say, you almost persuade me to be a Baptist. You almost persuade me to be a Methodist. You almost persuade he didn't. He said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. That's a, name, that's a persuading name. That's a persuasive name. And I'm hoping to persuade you this morning to just be a Christian. Number three, it's used in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, where Peter says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, 
but let him glorify God in this name. It's a God-glorifying name because it means follower of Christ. It doesn't mean follower of John Wesley. It doesn't mean follower of John Smith. It doesn't mean follower of Martin Luther. It means follower of Christ. Why can't we just do that? Why can't we just be that? We're getting ready to sing an invitation song, and it's decision time for you. And I realize you may be visiting here for the first time. It may be the first time you've ever heard such things. I hope it stirs you up. I hope it stirs you up so much that you go home and run through your Bible and study it and find out that I'm telling you the truth. I don't want you to accept it just because I said it, just because I'm standing in the pulpit and I say it. You go home and, and you search my words out. You open your Bibles up and search my words out and see if I'm not telling you the truth about these things. It's time to make a decision. Who are you going to stand with? As Joshua said long ago, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That's where I'm going to stand. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. In Acts 20, we alluded to earlier, 26 and verse 28, where Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. I like Paul's response there. Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but everybody who hears me this day would become not only almost, but altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Now, Paul was speaking literally because he was literally in chains for his faith. But think about this. I would today that you become almost and altogether such as I am, just a Christian, except for the chains of denominationalism. Drop them. Get shed of them. Get rid of the chains of denominationalism, the chains of division. Get rid of them. You can do it today. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess that faith and be baptized. The baptistry is right behind me, ready to go. All we need is you. If you're subject, won't you come now while we stand and while we sing?